We're pleased to be joined by Jody Balsam, professor of clinical law and director of externship programs at Brooklyn Law School. Jody, it's great to see you again. For those unfamiliar with this process, what exactly is happening in this courtroom today? Well, the uh, plaintiffs, the three of the Live 11 who are seeking temporary relief here, are going to have their lawyers argue why they're entitled to that. It's a, a four-pronged test, uh, starting with establishing that they actually have meritorious claims, that their claims are likely to succeed on the merits. Then second, that if they don't get this emergency relief, they will be irreparably harmed in a way that cannot be compensated for with monetary damages, that the type of harms they will encounter if they don't get the relief requested will leave them in a place that cannot be compensated monetarily. Uh, third, that the PGA tour whatever harms it alleges it might suffer if the relief were granted, uh, that those harms are nominal or not cognizable by the court. And finally, what is in the public interest here? The court will consider whether granting the relief sought by these three players of the Live 11 actually serves the public interest. Jody, prioritize those prongs for us, if you would. Would the court lend greater weight to some of that criteria than they would to others today? Well, typically in a motion like this, irreparable harm is the sine qua non. The players have to establish that they cannot be made whole with monetary damages. That is, at a later date, having the tour compensate them for what they would have earned had they played in the upcoming tournaments. Uh, and the PGA Tour is going to argue in response that, in fact, they are made whole with monetary compensation and they're receiving that compensation from Live Golf, which is indemnifying them in this lawsuit and for any losses that their participation in Live Golf might generate. Jody, do you have a sense from Judge Freeman's time on the bench or her history of rulings, how she might rule or at least what she might be focusing on today? Well, above all, she's going to be thorough and fair. Uh, and we have no reason to believe she has any familiarity with the business of golf in the level of detail or depth that she'll need to understand the antitrust claims in this lawsuit. That's the work cut out ahead for her, uh, that she'll have to do a deep dive in this in, into this industry. And I'm sure she's going to um, consider all the arguments and be as fair and thorough as she can. Uh, what that might mean for the parties is that while they need a resolution of the question, are the three players going to compete this weekend or not, they need that resolution within a day, they may not get a full-blown decision that quickly. The judge could potentially issue an order that covers simply the next upcoming tournament gives the emergency relief that the players want or not, and then later issue a more fulsome decision that explains her reasoning in detail, which she's required to do, but may not have the ability to do in the short time frame with, under which the players need a firm answer. Jody, what's your assessment of the cases that have been presented? You've gone into some detail reading both the, the three plaintiffs and the PGA Tour's response to it. How do you assess where each side stands on this? Well, what, what I found most interesting is that when we finally got an opportunity to hear the PGA Tour side of the story, right, the, the papers were filed by the Live 11 last week and the PGA Tour didn't have a chance to respond until yesterday, uh, we learned a very different story than Live Golf, the Live 11 um, presented in their papers. Uh, and one that I think makes th a couple of interesting points. Uh, first of all, uh, the position the PGA Tour is taking is that they do not have monopoly power, that they cannot affect the markets in a way that the antitrust laws are concerned with. And the key evidence they present for that position is that the markets have responded competitively, that when a new entrant came in, Live Golf, players' salaries responded by going up. Players are making more money than they have before. And the fact that the PGA Tour had to respond to Live Golf's entry by increasing compensation to players is a sign that the market is working, that, that the uh, claims of monopolistic conduct that might violate the antitrust laws have to be scrutinized a little more carefully than Live Golf would have it. The other um, I think an important point that are made in the PGA Tours papers is the one about free riding.
So they make, I think, a, a pretty convincing argument that what Lipgolf is trying to do here is actually avoid competition on the merits from its perspective, that what it is looking to do is to co-opt uh, a handful of the elite golfers to participate in their tour uh, only as long as they are also competing on the PGA Tour because that's where they reap the rankings, the celebrity, the fan base, and Live Golf wants to exploit that celebrity that was built on the back of the PGA Tour. Jody, I spoke to a Chicago securities attorney, Andrew Stoltman, earlier today, who said that whichever side wins the day, as it were, they will celebrate and, and act as if this has some broader meaning for the larger lawsuit. He then said that, that today's ruling will have little or no bearing on that broader lawsuit. Is that how you see it as well? What I predict out of today's ruling is a very limited response to an, a request for immediate relief that is not necessarily a predictor of what is going to unfold in the broader lawsuit, which will only happen after voluminous discovery, motions, um, and, and educating the judge as to how the business of golf operates and the um, economic structures that will determine her legal assessment of the antitrust claims. Jody, if the decision today doesn't have a huge impact on the long-term antitrust case, does it, any precedent that could be set today have an impact on the PGA Tour in the extent to which it would have to accommodate live golfers? Or could a live golfer decide a month from now that there's another tournament he's eligible for and file a similar action? Uh, where is the line drawn here? Right, so the only individuals who are seeking relief today are those three players that you identified. The other players who have brought this lawsuit are not seeking that relief, and they've pretty much um, passed the point where they can claim that emergency relief is something that they are entitled to. At some point later in the case, depending on how the PGA Tour responds to live golf and continues to discipline or sanction its players, you know, they can always bring uh, a later motion for preliminary injunctive relief for the pendency of the litigation. Um, but they haven't done so yet, and the fact that they let this time slip by does not put them in, a, in an ideal position to seek that relief. Jody, not all course, a course, a, a court cases are ultimately adjudicated. Some, as you know, are, are ultimately settled. In, in your reading of this lawsuit, do you see any path whatsoever toward a settlement so that neither side is potentially exposed to, to a criminal uh, proceeding? Well, I don't think there's any risk here of a criminal proceeding. I do think this litigation was brought strategically, seeking some accommodation or settlement from PGA Tour. Nobody wants to spend the next three, four, even five or six years litigating an antitrust case. It's just one tool in the arsenal that Live Golf has brought to bear to try to extract concessions and coexistence with the PGA Tour. And, and I just want to say that um, as a matter of the tactics that Live Golf has engaged in so far, from the perspective of the litigation papers they filed, I'm not sure they're making friends with this judge uh, in terms of long-term prospects for a friendly litigation environment. Um, one of the things that the PGA Tours papers uh, exposed was that there was some dissembling, some mischaracterization, even some falsehoods in the papers filed by Live Golf. If they have a strong case, they wouldn't need to rely on that. And if they're trying to get a judge to exercise her discretionary powers in ordering emergency relief, they would have been better set by dealing honestly with the court, which the PGA Tours papers expose. Jody, on that issue of the idea of the emergency, the PGA Tours papers keep hammering home the point that all three players were suspended on June 9th, were informed in advance of June 9th that they would be suspended, but have waited now until a few days before the tournament in which they're attempting to get an emergency order to play in. How much would that time frame impact the, the judge's assessment of, of the live players and the validity of this idea of the emergency? Right. So it does hurt their argument that there's an emergency here, but they have a counterfactual argument, which is that they appealed the sanctions that the PGA Tour imposed and that they were willing to uh, exhaust their administrative remedies, wait for the PGA's appellate process to take its to run its course. And that since it was a protracted process that didn't give them a resolution 
they're still waiting on that. Uh, they were their hand was forced, and they had no alternative given the importance of the upcoming FedEx Cup tournaments, to seek emergency relief to be allowed to play at least in those tournaments, if not beyond. So that's their argument. Um, and the court may not put much weight in it, but um, usually requests for emergency relief require something more significant of an emergency than one that we see here. Jody, I was fascinated by the list of four kind of factors that the, the judge will hear today in terms of the public interest, that, that somehow it would be in the public interest for these golfers to, to be granted this TRO. Can you expand on that note? Like, what is the bar that will have to be kind of cleared to, to reach that fourth plateau? Well, well it's interesting. Um, we, we have prior cases where the public interest factor was pretty significant in the award of a TRO. Prior cases in the sports industry, you may, be, may remember back in the 1990s when baseball was uh, internally at odds, we lost a full season of Major League Baseball in 1994 because of a strike, uh, uh, rather full uh, postseason because of a strike and a lockout. And ultimately, a court enjoined those activities, finding that it was in the public interest for baseball to go forward. Uh, I'm not sure if a court today would say it's in the public interest for golf to go forward. Uh, I think what they would examine is the uh, public interest in enforcing certain laws that are um, expressions of significant public policies, like free competitive markets. So what the court might consider to be in the public interest in our setting is that the antitrust laws prohibit certain types of anti-competitive conduct, and it's in the public interest to preserve free markets, and this emergency relief would do so. That's sort of the live golf argument there. Uh, the argument the PGA Tour would advance is that it's also in the public interest to honor one's contractual obligations, and that these players were, through a um, collective of contractual obligations, uh, had agreed to abide by PGA Tour rules, and they're the ones who are um, opposed to the public interest in um, abusing their, their rights under these contracts. Jody, you've suggested there could be several different kind of decisions that we get today or, or from this hearing, one side or the other, or perhaps a compromise decision that moves the process down the road some. What's your best guess of what that decision would be? And is there any appeals process in this for either side if they feel as though they didn't get the decision they wanted? So my, my um, sort of best guess at the worst case scenario for the PGA Tour is that relief is granted just for the upcoming weekend's event, uh, that they allow the players, the three of the Live 11, to participate in that, the, that event. It's been made known that the PGA Tour can accommodate that without any significant impact on other players or the event itself. And what you might see is a very... A small uh, concession to those players to allow them to play in one tournament while the judge considers the issues more fully and, and determines whether relief should extend beyond that. And she may find herself in a position after the tournament that the question is moot because if the players don't advance any further uh, to, through the FedEx Cup competition, uh, it may not be necessary for her to even reach the issue. Um, in terms of appeal, well, this is um, getting probably too, too specific for maybe some of your viewership, but it depends on what kind of relief that she awards. Um, a, a temporary restraining order, a TRO, is not appealable by either party. Uh, and that's because the relief it offers is usually ex extremely specific and limited. Uh, in fact, it can't extend more than 14 days. However, a TR motion, TRO motion can be converted into a preliminary injunction motion and a uh, broader, uh, lengthier preliminary injunction. If the court decides to take that step, then whatever the outcome is, it is appealable. Jody, the PGA Tour broke away from the PGA of America in 1968, became known as the PGA Tour more or less in the mid-1970s. It has thrived for most of its existence. How important of a day is this for the PGA Tour? Well, this might be the first of a series of conversations that we have, whether in court or out, uh, whether to pursue these litigation claims or settle them, that reshapes the PGA Tour. Um, you mentioned 
history dating back to the 1960s in professional golf. Some might recall in the 1980s, professional tennis was organized very differently the way it was today. Uh, as a result of an antitrust suit brought to shake up professional tennis, a new tour, a brand new tour was created. The Association of Tennis Professionals, the ATP tour, was actually created in the wake of an antitrust lawsuit to shake up the way that tennis had operated, professional tennis had operated, to give the players more flexibility, more control over their sport. I'm not saying that that is an analog or predictor of what will happen with the PGA Tour, but that's why antitrust lawsuits are so strategically important when you're trying to disrupt an industry. We saw something similar in Scotland last month, Jody, when four players went through a similar process, private arbitration to get into the field at the Genesis Scottish Open, led by Ian Poulter. So the field there went from 156 to 160. Does that decision in Britain have any bearing at all? Is that anything the judge is likely to give any weight to or any consideration to? No, that, that decision by a, a private arbitral tribunal in Scotland will have no precedential value. However, it may inform the judge as to what is possible with respect to the player seeking emergency relief today. So what the PGA Tour was able to do in response to that Scottish tribunal's ruling was accommodate the player seeking that relief, reconfigure the event without experiencing any irreparable harm, right? So the PGA Tour is gonna to come to court today and try to explain to the court while they that they too will suffer irreparable harm in the face of the request for relief by these three players. And it might be difficult for them to establish the harms to the PGA Tour, given that they abided by an injunction in Scotland that did seem to immediately cause them any harm. A lot of complex issues in this lawsuit. Jody, thanks so much for joining us again. We hope to speak to you again soon. Yep. Jody Balsam.